Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Loudon from Total Health Conferencing and I'm here tonight uh, with three incredible women. Um, we're gonna be talking about navigating race and gender in medicine. So I'm gonna go straight into introductions because we only have an hour and we have so much to cover. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Edith Peterson Mitchell, board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology and is clinical professor for the Department of Medicine and Medical Oncology at Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. She's the Associate Director for Diversity Programs and Director of the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities. She's also notably a retired Brigadier General for the U.S. Air Force, being awarded over 15 military service medals and ribbons. She's married and the mom of two daughters and a grandma of three. I believe that that's still accurate, Dr. Mitchell. That's still accurate. Okay, uh, Dr. Christina Mirabel Bell earned her bachelor's degree and medical doctorate from Harvard University, both with honors. She completed her residency training at the Harvard Radiation Oncology Program and earned a master's in public health during her training. She has published extensively on quality of life in female cancer survivors. She works for 21st Century Oncology here in Florida, and she's married to a physician and the mom of two sons. Uh, and Dr. Erica stringer Reeser completed her internal medicine internship at Tulane University and internal medicine residency at Baptist Health System in Birmingham. She completed two fellowships at the University of Chicago, one in hematology oncology, and the other in clinical pharmacology and pharmacogenomics. She's a faculty member at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and her clinical interests are women's health, breast cancer, and developmental therapeutics. She's married and a mom of three little ones. So I want to thank you all for being here tonight uh, with us. You know, when we, when we started this um, video blog, really, and podcast, um, on Inspired, we were looking for opportunities to kind of reach an audience at this time where so much of what the media um, and really public health officials are focused on is controlling this pandemic. Uh, and there were huge gaps in the fact that people still wanted to hear positive, uplifting, inspiring stories that affected them where they were uh, in their careers and beyond. And so this has been met with such resonating um, positivity. And when we decided we were going to do a program on navigating race and gender, as you can imagine, it just really blew up. It was something that women found important, people of color found important, um, minorities found important, and advocates that, you know, all around just want uh, to stand up for equality um, and stand up for, you know, things that matter to kind of a growing, evolving population. And so I'm so honored, really, to have all three of you here. And we're going to dive into a lot of different topics tonight. But I wanted to really start with asking each one of you, growing up, who was your greatest influence? I know that's a big question that could be answered with one podcast each, but if you had to answer who was your greatest influence, just give me a short um, answer of who and why. Dr. Mitchell, I'm going to start with you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And for me, my greatest mentor was my great-grandfather, who became ill when I was three years old. And I overheard family members talking about you couldn't take him to the hospital because they didn't treat black patients um, adequately. And my um, aunts and uncles set up a uh, schedule of who was going to be with him. And I was so impressed with my great grandfather and how he uh, maneuvered his dying, uh, but there was a um, gentleman, a doctor, who would make house calls. Mm. And the first day he came and I saw him, I said, 
when I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor just like Dr. Logan. And Grandpa, I'm going to make sure you get your uh, correct care. So I decided when I was 30 years old, I was going to become a doctor and I was going to fight for uh, equity and equality in healthcare. And I've been doing that all my life. Wow, amazing, thank you. Dr. Mabel Beal? Um, I'd have to say my parents and specifically thinking about my father. Um, so he was an older dad. Um, so when I was born, he was 60. Um, and he was originally a Haitian immigrant um, and had a PhD in linguistics. So he emigrated to the United States in 1949 as a graduate student at Florida A&M and was able to really come of age and obtain his higher education, you know, at a time pre and during the civil rights movement. And then with that lens, you know, ended up having me later in life um, and always shared his unique perspective with me, both on obtaining education, um, you know, interacting in, in the healthcare system particularly. And, you know, given our family was still in Haiti, um, unfortunately, a lot of healthcare uh, disparities and inequalities in care and access to care were always very present kind of growing up. And as the, the branch of the family that had been able to make it to the United States and still had connections there, you know, frequently we would be trying to either bring relatives to the United States to obtain health care, sending money back, navigating with those things. And my father was, I mean, tremendously educated in a formal way, but had so much distrust for the health care system. And that colored a lot of interactions throughout my lifetime and even in subsequently with his own health and obtaining care at the end of his life. So that very much impacted me throughout my childhood and growing up. And um, it's a perspective that I definitely carry with me as a physician as well. Mm, wow. We'll get into some of, you know, exploring some of that um, and how maybe some of those things have affected each one of you. Uh, Dr. Stringer Reeser? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, how do I follow those <laughs> comments? I mean, you know, absolutely wonderful. And I think that, you know, you'll see from all of us panelists that we got there in a little bit different way. So my mom uh, is a, a nurse and she will always come home with very interesting, um, you know, uh, conversations about her patients and what she did today. And it was so intriguing to my sisters and myself. And I had two older um, sisters um, and I was the youngest and I never wanted to be left behind. So when my sisters uh, got old enough to volunteer as like candy stripers at the, um, at the local hospital I didn't want to be left behind so when I got old enough to uh, follow them of course I followed them to the hospital and I really found out that I really loved health care um, and really loved patient care and I told my mom you know what I'm not going to um, college to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a physician. And mm -hmm. she said, what? We're changing plans? Your senior year of college? I mean, senior year of high school? And I said, yeah, you know, I want to be a physician. Um, and subsequently, my oldest sister uh, is a physician too. Um, so, you know, just from my mom, just starting general conversations at, at the dinner table, um, you know, and afterwards, we, we followed uh, in her healthcare uh, field uh, tracks. Yeah. Well, it sounds like all three of you really were influenced by seeing or experiencing something, um, you know, whether Erica, it's you with your mom, seeing the way she came home, the way she kind of connected with patients, the stories of the different things that she would experience and then going into volunteerism. Um, and Christina, I, I can identify so much with you. My mom's actually a Trinidadian nurse. Um, and when my, my grandpa was sick, a lot of the same kind of distrust. Islanders very much distrust. They almost believed we're going to the hospital to die. Um, and I think a lot of that's cultural too. You know, in islands, you don't really have convalescent homes. Everybody, you know, family members keep um, aging grandpa, aging grandma, aging mom, aging dad at home. Um, and so the hospital is always this kind of place where it's not where what we as Americans think it is. Uh, so that really kind of touched me a little to hear how your dad, who was so educated in so many other ways, never 
fully trusted the healthcare system. And I think that that comes with a lot of his own experiences, um, both learned um, and what he went through himself. And then um, Edith, just to hear that from such a young age, you know, you had an experience where you knew this is what you were called to do, not just from a practice perspective, but from a, a perspective where something's got to change. It's not okay that you know, the whole family has to create almost a plan um, to keep great grandpa alive because the hospital system wasn't, you know, there to accept um, people of color. So it's really incredible to hear, you know, how ever, all of you came to where you are now, such impactful, talented um, female physicians. Did you ever feel different? Or maybe can you talk about the first time you felt that being black or being a woman or being a black woman um, caused the outside world to treat you differently. Was there ever a moment in your life, in school, in career, where it was like, oh, that's what they're talking about? Um, maybe we'll start, Dr. Mitchell, if we can start with you. Oh, certainly. So I think the one uh, event that I think of still very frequently was when um, early in my fellowship and apparently I did not know about it but there was a patient who said that she did not want uh, any of those uh, inward doctors uh, mm -hmm. to take care of her and yet she had been assigned to me. I was the only uh, African-American fellow uh, for that group. In fact, I was the second woman to finish my fellowship and the first African-American. Wow. So I was on call first weekend of fellowship. So early July and Saturday night, I got a phone call that this patient was in the emergency room and not doing well. So I went to the hospital and it was very obvious that uh, her respiratory rate uh, was high and her respiratory status deteriorating. So there was um, the um, anesthetists in the hospital were all in the emergency room. It was the gunshot club and consequently, lots of surgeries going on Saturday night. So I looked at things and I was, um, I had a very good internal medicine training program. So I could intubate people as well as anybody. And seeing this patient deteriorate, I intubated her, uh, set the respirator, and then transferred her to ICU. So by the time the anesthesiologist arrived, uh, I already had stabilized the patient's um, uh, respiratory pattern and had set the respirator uh, as it should and had everything taken care of. So Monday morning, there is always um, a meeting early in the morning where all the fellows, all the attendings get together and find out what has transpired over the weekend. So when I present this case and uh, by Monday morning, she had been extubated and uh, everybody was amazed, you know, this was great. And then one of the second or third year fellows told me that that was the patient who did not want uh, the N-word um, um, taking care of her. But by then she was so appreciative uh, that I saved her life, uh, we became really good friends. Wow. So I think that uh, there is pressure and that pressure is to do what you know you can do and do at all times and there will be recognition uh, of your expertise mm -hmm. uh, so it's to always be who you are 
Mm. And therefore, that has stuck with me all of my career, and it has done well for me. And thank you for mentioning my military career, because that was another experience. And actually, I was the first physician woman ever to become a general in the Air Force. Wow. So again, it's be who you are, always have that self-confidence in what you can do, and therefore things work out. Yes. Well, you have been an incredible um, trailblazer in so many areas. I know from our work with you um, every summer when you lead incredible town halls um, of medical experts. I mean, I've year over year, I feel like I just learn more and more about the dimensions of how powerful a woman you are, um, how powerful a physician you are, and just how powerful an advocate, a, just a human equality advocate you are. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. Maribel Bell, can you share a time where you felt um, being a woman or being a black woman or both, where you just felt it, you felt like that's what people talk about when they talk about uh, discrimination or inequality? Um, there's so many, um, I guess, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, I guess in contrast to that really empowering story uh, that Dr. Mitchell just shared, um, a time I distinctly remember was early in my training um, when I was in a, a mixed conference, like a tumor board, where there's basically folks from different specialties at different levels of training, you know, meeting in a conference room to discuss challenging cases. And, you know, in this room, I was the only African American. I was also um, one of the youngest as a trainee. Um, and, you know, my background, I'd gone to Harvard College, Harvard Medical School. And the patient was a VIP of sorts who, you know, made a point that, you know, he was being seen at a Harvard hospital and only wanted Harvard trained people. Um, and I remember as the staff were kind of discussing this and kind of joking about it because, you know, obviously there's a lot of elitism in that, that, you know, could be unpacked for days. Um, one of the, the mentors that I was training under made the comment, you know, people will always say stuff like that, but in a training program, you really want the white man to be your doctor because they didn't get there based on quotas and affirmative action. Um, wow. And, you know, I'm sitting here as the only person looking as I do um, in a very junior position. And I just remember feeling gut punched and also not able to really, to really stand up and say something. And I come back, you know, I finished my training and I was attending and like, how would I have handled that differently if I were at, you know, later stages of my training to feel more empowered? To, like, what do you say in a moment like that? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just what I did, which was kind of shrink and feel embarrassed um, and sad that, gosh, I'm not felt like I belong here. Um, and I think that, that interactions like that unfortunately happen to a lot of, you know, people who are othered um, throughout their journeys. And it just really underscored the importance of mentors and having safe spaces to talk about things like that. Because um, you know, even though in that moment, in that tumor board, I wasn't able to address it. I did have mentors in my program who cared um, and that I ultimately felt comfortable sharing that with. Um, and I did end up you know, growing in my program, growing in my voice, growing as a physician in spite of that interaction. Um, and I wish I could say that that was the most egregious or the only time I've heard comments like that. But even as a practicing physician, I've heard similar comments. So yeah. the ignorance will be out there, but I think the importance of um, growing into your voice and mm -hmm. understanding your work, and um, especially when you have a unique skill set that you are more than competent in sharing with the world and your patients, that just becomes so much more important. Um, and then also looking back and advocating for the person in the room who may not feel strong enough to advocate for themselves. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that, that that's all, um, those are all experiences that I think, again, whether you're a minority, whether you're a woman, I mean, I, I remember being um, asked at one of my medical education programs 
they wanted to see the director. And I said, oh, I'm the director of the program. They said, no, I want to see your boss. And I said, well, I own the company, so I don't know that there's really anybody over me that, could, that you can see. And they said, what do you, how do you own the company? And then they kind of like, it was, of course, an a older man. And I said, well, I just decided one day that I'd like to own a medical education company. And so here you are, you know, as one of my learners. And, um, you know, he just kind of left me with this feeling of just like well, how you said, you know, what could I have said differently? He like left me with that feeling of I wish I would have at my feet right there have had something to say back because he left me in a way feeling small, questioning, you know, should I be here? And going back to what Dr. Mitchell said, it's like, I'm just being me. Like I'm being who I know I can be. And like you said, I'm being the best version of that. And I put so much attention and so much detail and so much care and learning into being able to educate physicians because I know on the other side of that education is a patient in a room. And it's like you sit there and say, why was it that someone didn't believe that I could do that? Um, and, you know, later I had emailed the person saying, I'm so I emailed him saying, I'm sorry if I said anything offensive to you. Or, and he just wrote back and said, no, it's just been my experience that, you know, program directors of educational programs are men. And that was it. He didn't say not anything else. So I remember feeling, you know, it's kind of like, wow. And when I looked into it, it's real. It's like, there are no other program directors in oncology medical education that are women. And it made me kind of sit back and say, why? Um, because, you know, you have all of this talent in academic centers uh, that you would think that people would really look to kind of spreading that information out um, in a way that touches other audiences. So I can identify with what uh, you went through. Uh, Dr. stringer Reeser, can you identify a time or name a time where you first felt being a woman or being a black woman um, kind of made you the other that Christina uh, so aptly described? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so certainly I think, um, you know, I saw a little bit more of a, a divide during my medical training, um, of course, and I think uh, we can all echo that feeling of feeling a little bit smaller and um, feeling like the double minority, be feeling um, like you're the minority because you're black and the other one is that you're female um, and somewhat feeling a little bit more um, inferior or smaller in, in that sense. And, you know, I can definitely echo, you know, being trained uh, in the South, right? Um, you could see a little bit more sometimes at times, you know, not, not everywhere, but, you know, you're talking about in the 2000s being trained and, um, you know, still having that, that bias of, you know, are you, are you a physician? Are you, when you walk into the room with a white coat, that you're always the nurse, mm -hmm. you know, but a male in scrubs could walk into the same room and always be called doctor, um, you know, and be, maybe be part of the cleanup crew, right? And so, you know, um, you know, I would often, you know, go in as a medical student, um, you know, addressing myself as, you know, such, or um, even uh, as an intern and a resident, um, being called Dr. S you know, such and such, Dr. Stringer, and always being, you know, in the morning, patients, oh, are you here to, you know, get my labs? And, you know, I was often, um, you know, faced with some of those, uh, you know, discouraging words, like, uh, you know, that they don't want a uh, a black person to touch them. Um, and I remember, you know, on several occasions, um, my attendings would say, you know, we come as a team, you mm. know, and um, if you're going to see me, you're going to um, respect uh, my medical student and um, this physician, and, um, and you're going to, you know, she's going to see you and examine you. You know, um, they will always, you know, be very uh, acute and staunch with, you know, the patients. And at that point, usually the, the patients would turn around and change their tone about um, not wanting to be touched by a minority, et cetera. But I think you have to have uh, colleagues and attendings um, and even mentors um, 
like you know, all of us in the panel have talked about being able to um, express these stories of concern because you know, even though you train so hard, um, it can those kind of words and slights can get into your spirit emotionally. And even though you're already set strong and you've made so many strides and accomplishments, you know, that can kind of get into your spirit. So you have to be able to talk, be able to talk to a mentor or a colleague or family member about um, how that made you feel. And, and then move forward. I mean, I remember um, making some of the decisions on where I wanted to train in fellowship around, I don't know if I want to train in the South, <laughs> just because of small voices, right? Um, and that wasn't over 90% of the patients, right, that that said that. But, you know, that five, you know, that less than 10% of, um, you know, controversy made me think, maybe I want to train up North and stay there. <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, I just challenge everyone to, um, you know, offset that tone, you know, know that you are worth it. You know, you uh, have definitely um, you earned it. Yeah, you've earned it. You know, um, you have every right to be there. Um, and it's always going to be the patient's choice, whether they um, want to be treated by whatever physician, but, you know, that's on them. Yes. <laughs> you know? um, so I don't want anyone to, you know, walk away feeling like they're smaller and less than, you know, that's not the, um, that is not the opinion of the majority of people. Yes. And, you know, you said a couple of things that I thought were important to take away from that. You know, one person, one person saying something to you can stir up so much and can tear down so much. You know, words matter, behaviors matter, kindness matters. And at the same time, one person standing next to you, holding you up, defending you, can equally mean so much. So I think that's a really important takeaway that in the same way each of us have the power to tear someone down, each of us have the power to build someone up. Mm -hmm. So especially in the professional workplace, you know, whether you're a woman noticing that someone's being picked on, bullied, um, harassed in some way, um, or whether you see something because of, you know, someone's race, um, you do have the power to stand up and say something. And I think a lot of people, you know, there's fear prevents them from doing that, the fear of, well, what's gonna happen to me? But I think the real question is, well, what's gonna happen to us if I don't stand up and say something? Um, so, okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and kind of get into some practical questions. So I wanna take a moment to celebrate that I think it was either this year or last year, for the first time ever, over 50% of the entering medical school class were women. Um, I find that to just be really incredible. I mean, we have come so far in such a short time uh, with that cultural divide that, you know, 50 girls were empowered by a great grandpa, a parent, a mom, a teacher, someone told them you can go to medical school, you can be a doctor. And they decided to believe it and apply. So I really love that that is a reality. At the same time, I was reading this um, JAMA internal medicine article that looked at about 30,000 surveys of graduates from 150 medical schools, all colors, all races, all sexual orientations, and it said that um, the results were that students of color, women, and lesbian, gay, or bisexual students experienced more mistreatment, including public humil humiliation and offensive remarks almost twice as more frequently than their white peers in medical school. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mitchell, what does this say, you know, that we've got 50% of them entering class women, at the same time, double the number of women and minorities are discriminated against publicly in medical school. What does that say about where we've come and where we still have to go? So I think that once one reaches a certain level, whether it's a personal level or group level as uh, women, uh, there are still some places to go. And one of the things that we look at, sure, 
50%, more than 50% in most medical schools now uh, consist of women. However, when you look at academic centers and women who are chairs of departments, mm -hmm. who are full professors, uh, and who are at the higher level, uh, deans or uh, presidents of medical schools, there are still so few women in those top positions. And yet you look at, let's say, the instructor or uh, assistant professor level, there are lots of women. So in reaching the higher uh, academic positions, uh, women who are uh, heads of um, practices, whether it's in the community setting or in the academic setting, uh, women still have not reached the top levels in the uh, numbers that we would like to see. So we still need more women uh, continuing to uh, excel continuing to find those mentors and mentors are great but you also need some sponsors yeah. uh, mentors will give you personal information to help you uh, decide on um, activities and events in your career but it's so important to have a sponsor mm -hmm. who's going to not only tell you but who's going to open a door mm. or help you uh, find that position. So uh, in discussing with people, in reaching out to other individuals, uh, women still need to do a little bit more of that so that not only are you preparing yourself for those top level positions, but you are having some individuals who can actually open a door or unlock a door to help get uh, you into the position. Yeah. So while we've come a long way, both in terms of race and gender, we still have some um, levels to go, some steps to reach, some stairs to climb, uh, and therefore we've got to keep working. Yes, yes. And I think forums like this and conversations like this that can open the door to women after they listen to the three of you and to other women who really have kind of given their lives and careers um, to including levels of advocacy, you know, they have to ask themselves some hard questions. Who am I not only mentoring, but as you said, who am I sponsoring? Who did I immediately think of lifting up when I got my promotion? Um, and you know who which door can I open for which woman that has kind of come up with me? Um, because I, I think when you look at kind of the man side of the world those questions are primary in their head You know, they they work in packs They kind of make sure that they take care of their brothers and I think it's time really for sisters to start doing that that it's not just really about us achieving the goals that we set out it's really about us when we get there looking back and saying, you know, who can we pull up with us? So I, I think that what you're saying is, has, a lot of, um, has a lot of merit and also has a call to action built into it. One uh, other thing I'd like to add is that by the time we finish medical school, we're all looking forward to have kids mm -hmm. and to start a family. And for women, we take care of the kids, we go to work, Mm -hmm. uh, we bring some work home sometimes. Uh, for men, they go out to a bar or golf or other things that men do with men. Yes. And therefore, I think it's so important that we find those opportunities to work with people, not only with other women, but with men also, uh, because a lot of mentoring occurs not in a formal uh, career uh, uh, environment, but much mentoring occurs in social environments. So we've got to make sure that we have all of the auspices for taking care of our kids, 
but allowing us to do some socialization as well. Yes, yes agreed. Um, Dr. Mirabel Bell, I'm going to ask you the next question. I, you know, we're moving now from medical school to training. I read an article by the American Medical Association that said that more than 75% of medical students reported feeling inadequately prepared to address race in medicine by their graduating year. And I'll contextualize that by saying, um, race, like other important topics in medicine, including gender, sex, sexuality, and disability, requires a level of training and comprehension that's much more nuanced than a simple direction. Uh, and it's concluded by saying experiences, the experiences that these graduates have not been exposed to kind of social um, um, development or training, you know, how to communicate with patients that come in with different um, social, economic, et cetera, um, um, situations, those experiences have led physicians to burnout, depression, um, and even sometimes early career, you know, abandoning their careers because, you know, maybe they trained in a certain place like uh, Dr. Reeser was saying, thinking of going to the North and staying there. Well, sometimes you don't really get a choice of where you're gonna go. You kind of go where the opportunities open up. And it says sometimes it has even led, from, led to people leaving their, um, careers. What do you say, where do you think the disconnect is in medical school training? Um, why even after all of this time, there aren't those core communication classes for physicians? Why do you think that disconnect uh, exists? Gosh, there's a, a lot to unpack there. I think, um, well, first, I mean, medical school is only four years and there's so much to learn. You know, in addition to all the science and pathophysiology and disease processes, there's the culture of medicine, there's how to function on a team, there's how to be, you know, in a hospital. Um, you know, even for students who, you know, let's say everyone in their family is in medicine, you know, it's still very different when you're in the wards and kind of absorbing that culture on its own. And my sense is a lot of medical education is kind of wrestling with, you know, how do we balance what's traditionally been the medical canon to make sure that our physicians are educated and what they need to know to save lives. And also a lot of these kind of social issues that, you know, in 21st century medicine are very important. Um, I remember, you know, when I was at Harvard Medical School, they kind of were reforming the curriculum to, in addition to having, you know, all your standard, you know, anatomy, physiology classes and the, being in the wards, we had a mandatory medical ethics class. We had a mandatory cultural competency class. We had, you know, Paul Farmer teaching us about, you know, social determinants of health and global health. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an amazing opportunity. And even in this candy store of, you know, experts in the field talking about these issues that are very important, there was still this stress of, but I got to study for my boards. <laughs> and I've got to, you know, worry about my shelf exam and my rotation to make sure that I'm impressing my residents that I know core medicine. So I think anytime you have more items than you have minutes in the day, there's going to be this push pull. Um, my hope is, and you know, who knows, maybe this can even be a silver lining in, in kind of you know, cultural shift, like what's happening with this pandemic. We see that you know, medicine isn't just as simple as disease, solution, cure. There are so many social determinants of health and economic factors that weigh into how we manage, you know, a simple medical problem. Um, and I think until as a society and as a culture in medicine that we see that all of those issues are in some sense just as an even more important than some of the, the basic science, um, it has to have a voice at the table, I think, for us to even start to see how we can more thoughtfully integrate it into our education systems for our doctors in training. And we're still figuring it, I think, too, even as practicing physicians, you know, having these discussions um, in practices to try to make sure that we're, we're factoring in cultural competence um, and all of this awareness to make sure that we're able to provide best care for our patients. So it's something I struggle with as a physician. I think, you know, in community setting, in academic centers, they probably have their own version of it. So it's definitely something we all need to work on, I think, more strategically. Mm -hmm. 
And, and Dr. Reeser, you know, building on um, what Dr. Bell was talking about, uh, you know, there are all of these determinants in clinical practice. So by the time now you're out of training and you're left with, depending on where you went to school, um, the, the ability to communicate differently or to identify differently with different patients that come in um, to your practice, maybe even more so in academics than in communities since academics seem to get people seeking you out, whereas in community, it's more people that are local to the practice. Um, do you find that race plays a part in the way you practice medicine? Are you thinking when a patient comes in of a certain uh, either social construct or economic construct, are you all automatically thinking about um, um, follow-up visits? Will they come? Financially, what can they afford? you know, in terms of compliance with their medication schedule, are you thinking of those things actively or do you let it play out as the patient uh, continues to come into your practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I, I certainly think that, um, you know, where you um, were, you know, received your education does play some role in how um, you interpret how the patient is doing. So I remember even in medical school, for one of our rotations in uh, family medicine, they made us go to an inner city or rural area uh, to practice. And part of that is, you know, kind of understanding the culture of the patients um, and actually getting outside of those walls um, of a, you know, standard hospital setting uh, and getting some hands-on, um, you, know, uh, you know, experience, you know, treating patients of, of different backgrounds. Um, you know, certainly, um, again, you know, uh, where I trained at, um, in particular, even in Chicago, you know, uh, we tried to, you know, um, upfront look at the, the, um, the patient as a whole when they come in um, and do some certain intakes. And, you know, even in my practice uh, now um, at University of Alabama at Birmingham, um, there is some intake uh, that we do on the patients to, to find out are they having any um, financial burdens up front before starting? Um, are, they are, are they anxious about losing their insurance? You know, do they have insurance? Um, can we set them up um, with um, the case manager or social worker at the time of the visit uh, to figure out? Because, you know, we can even write or prescribe, you know, simple antibiotics and we're like, oh, no problem. That's on the $4 formulary. That patient will be able to afford it. Um, but they may have five other medications um, that they've already had to, um, you know, prescribe that much, you know, that month for their hypertension and diabetes and may blow off the antibiotics um, and can get septic, you know, um, just because they didn't take those antibiotics. So they were taking them every other day and, and things like that, which is not adequate for treatment. So we definitely have to be sensitive to that. Um, um, you know, I think um, as physicians, you know, sometimes we have so many patients packed in a day uh, that sometimes we can't get the whole uh, story. So we may get part of the hardship, but not all of the hardship. And so for patients that I am concerned about um, to have more to the story, I try to see them a little bit uh, more frequently or, you know, add in some of my ancillary staff, like my nurse practitioner or follow phone calling with my, my nurse. Um, but even then, some patients may have cell phone service one week, but the next week they don't. Um, and so, you know, we have to be really cognizant of who we're treating and, um, you know, the whole person and how mm -hmm. we can, um, you know, better um, treat our patients in the community because, um, you know, you're right, certainly they can get the diagnosis, but they may not follow up if they don't have rods, right? So, yeah. um, um, yeah. provide resources. And, you know, I live and work in, in South Florida. I started my career early at the University of Miami, and I remember working uh, at Jackson Memorial, where it was like you, a lot of the things you're describing, you just say, I'm not going to see that patient again. Like, you have to almost make a plan to tell them why this is important and then why the three other things that you have to do are important because you know they're not going to be able to get here again for, you know, a myriad of reasons. Um, and it just makes the delivery of care difficult because I, you know, as each of you have, 
have um, made an oath or you know decided that this is the way you're you're going to spend your passion and your mission you want ultimately healing to be um, the outcome but sometimes it's so difficult based on different barriers uh, to get there so um okay well let's pivot a little bit you're all wives and moms and we've got one grandma on the panel um you know dr mitchell talked a little bit about the balance you know when you're when you're getting out of training that's just about the time that you're thinking about family planning and family planning to mom is very different than family planning to dad. Um, and I would like for each of you to kind of talk to me a little bit about the ways you've incorporated balancing work, life, um, you know, academics, busy community practices, and, um, and the balance of, you know, career priorities between you and your husband's managing such a, a demanding um, career on your own. Dr. Mitchell, I'll start with you, uh, and maybe you can even talk about how that's evolved over time. Certainly. So it's so important to incorporate what I call your 360 life, mm -hmm. and that's all of the components of your life, and involve others with you so I was very fortunate that um, my mother would travel uh, with my husband and me, um, as well as her sister. My mother's sister had one boy. My mother has six daughters. So my aunt um, loved to share in our lives. And for all six of us, uh, my aunt was involved. So there was family uh, that could be incorporated into our lifestyle. My husband and I both worked uh, so that we shared responsibilities. And I always try to do fun things. So I love to sew. Mm -hmm. And my older daughter was about five and in a um, dance uh, group. And um, so they were all talking about what they were going to wear. And my daughter says, oh, my mother sews. So I ended up staying up one night making 12 tutus. Uh, and I thought it was kind of funny, but you know, you go through that stress of how you do it. Uh, but the kids all loved it and were so appreciative of the outfits. So you look at each component of what the children do, how you can incorporate them into what you do. Consequently, I travel a lot and I give a lot of lectures all over the world. And when there was an opportunity, I would take my kids with me and uh, we would have fun things together. So it's really looking at your overall life and how you can share it with others. So that cooking, I love, and everybody in my family loves to cook. So we all get together and each one cooks something and therefore there is sharing with the whole family. Uh, and the whole family includes my siblings and um, my parents' siblings as well and all of their kids. So that dinner at my house on Thanksgiving, for example, could be 35, 40 people. Uh, but it's just working into your schedule what you want to do. Make sure that you have that time uh, to do well, to study or to do research, but also make sure that you incorporate that family time. And the other things uh, that are important in your life. Yes, yes, I love that. I love that 360 life because that really does speak to how we're all trying to manage all the different dimensions and facets. Uh, Dr. Bell, being married to a physician, how, how do you balance being parents to, you know, skyrocketing careers, very busy, 
how have you come to balance, um, you know, the, the double physician home? It's a work in progress. <laughs> we do better some days than others. Um, so I'm a radiation oncologist and my husband's an orthopedic surgeon. Even we met when we were in medical school. He was already a senior. He had matched in orthopedics and I was still figuring out what specialty I was going to do. I wanted to do oncology. And I remember there was a point where I thought seriously, just given the type of cancer, I like I do a lot of women's cancers. I thought I'm going to do GY oncology. And I remember us having this talk, like, listen, if we plan to get married um, and have kids, depending on the timing, this could be tougher since he was already, you know, fully on in orthopedics and you know, GYN oncology would involve four years of OBGYN plus three years of GYN oncology. Plus we'd both be intense surgeons. Yeah. Um, and I remember, I mean, we were serious enough in our relationship and honest enough, I think, in our, our aspirations to kind of say, well, you know, do I need to do GYN oncology? You know, what would our family balance look like? And is that in tune with, I guess, our version of, you know, the Life360 view, like what our goals were in being able to support each other? Um, and ultimately, I chose radiation oncology. You're able to do a lot of GYN oncology, and I do, um, in your practice. Um, and then, you know, it became being staggered at different journey, parts of your journey. You know, somebody's always matching for something or flying for something or traveling or taking a board exam at a different time. Um, and I think for us, it's, it's very much um, been about honesty, kind of um, communicating expectations. We're both um, very ambitious perfectionists when it comes to our work. Um, and we had to just, you know, be incredibly organized and ask for a lot of help when necessary. You know, fortunately, or not fortunately, it's just the way it is. I'm an only child, so I'm a spoiled only child. And so my mommy helps me a lot. <laughs> and our family balance works because um, my mom is able to do a lot of the overflow child care. Um, and then we also have my kids, are, I have twin boys, they're almost five, so they're school age now. Um, but I definitely had to let go of some of my own personal mom guilt. Um, especially since, you know, my, my, I am an only child and my mom was a stay at home mom and her modeling of motherhood looks very different than mine can as a full-time working physician and kind of being accept, being okay with, um, kind of the compromises and how that looks and then forging our own traditions. So yeah. And now my boys, we do study dates together and daddy's finishing his op notes. Mommy's signing her images and two boys have their coloring books and we're all doing things frantically after dinner together. Wow. Um, and, you know, I look forward to kind of growing with them and I think they, they're young, but they still are kind of getting an understanding of what happens um, and why we leave them sometimes. But even now, <clears throat> excuse me, it's still a, a little tough when they say, well, if everyone's home and schools are closed because everyone's sick, why are my mommy and daddy still always leaving first thing in the morning? Yeah. And so yeah. Kind of helping them understand that has been, has been interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm sure I love how the, you know, that your first answer was it's a work in progress because, you know, you, you can't measure against even another physician, physician family. You can't measure against how our parents raised us. You can't measure against how, you know, non-healthcare worker families, it's kind of like you've got to just build your own 360 life and make it work where everybody feels safe and loved and, you know, protected. So I love that, that that's the way you're approaching it, that both of you are approaching it. And I know that those boys are, are getting the best of both of you um, as you do it. And then Dr. Reeser, <laughs> Girl, I don't know how you do it. This question, I don't even know how you're going to answer. Five, two and a half, and one year old at home. You're a busy oncologist. Uh, your husband must be a saint. I'm going to call, you got to do something special for him for Father's Day this year, especially. How do you do it? How do you manage three kids, little ones, and still have a growing, busy career? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's challenging. You know, I, I definitely say it is a still a work in progress. Um, communication has to be, you know, key with your spouse. Um, and, and you're right, you know, as you're in kind of that middle age group, you know, um, both of us are kind of at a pinnacle of our, our career. And so, you know, still remain very ambitious. Um, so what I tried to do is just, you know, and, and when I think about like how my parents modeled um, parenthood, you know, I definitely try to take away things that I absolutely love, like, um, you know, trying to sit down for dinner, you know, with the family, you Mm -hmm. know, because those are times where you can reconnect uh, with each other, you know, pray with each other and, you know, just catch up, you know, what's going on at daycares, you know, so my daughter recently um, turned five, but she's very talkative and, you know, we, we can find out, you know, what went right that day, what didn't go so right that day um and um and so i think that that's a way that you can reconnect you can reconnect and you know with your um spouse if they're able to be there you know again at dinner time um is a way of just kind of getting a debrief of the day um and sometimes you can just even pick a debrief of the week um to just figure it out my kids aren't quite old enough for us to travel all together but we have taken some trips when i when i did have two instead of the third um and we've gone places like hawaii where you know we just you know took a week you know to enjoy you know friends and also enjoy each other and do some um tourism you know kind of things and those things uh even though my daughter you know was a little bit younger you know she still remembers those uh, even the stuffed animals that, that she received the dolphins and and walks around so you you definitely can make an impression on that and then lastly you know i just try to figure out you know some elements that i really love um and even if you can put on your vision board eight elements of things that you know, are very important to you, you know, um, so that you get some self-care. So during those times, the way I kind of regroup myself is, I like going to the hair salon. It's a little difficult now with COVID. (laughs) So I got a whole nother appreciation with that, but, um, you know, and kind of making that top priority, you know, on my list that, you know, I'm going to be able to, you know, try to reconnect weekly or every other week so that I can kind of replenish myself so that I'm better for my family. Um, And then exercising, you know, um, you know, trying to put that as a higher priority. And one of my other favorite things is um, just reading to my kids. I I love to catch them before bedtime and snuggle um, right beside them um, and really just, you know, take that time to Three, three books, guys. Everybody gets, you know, we get three books and we really concentrate on that and they just love it. And, mm. um, you know, I know that, you know, when they're 16, they may not appreciate it, <laughs> but those are always be those uh, memories that I embed in my heart. Um, so just trying to figure out things that are important for the family and for me. Yes, yes, I love it. And as a mom of a 16 year old, I'm guaranteeing you that they're not gonna love it. But I am told that they come back around. <laughs> so, um, well, as we round out the interview, I really want to just ask each one of you for almost like a sentence takeaway. You know, we talked about a lot of challenges. We've talked about a lot of experiences, um, and then kind of come into, you know, balancing life both from a feminine perspective and from a a race perspective. Um, But what's good news? You know, right now you turn on the TV and you have this really, really horrific story um, about this young jogger. Uh, And, you know, you, you watch things like that and you say, how is that still happening? You know, like, how is that allowed to happen? How is it Still happening, and then you see kind of the uprising on the other side of everyone um, supporting that this has to stop. Uh, so, you know, when you think about balancing the good and the, the places we still have to go and grow, how do you, you know, maybe if you could give me a takeaway each, um, and we've just got a few minutes left, a takeaway each of what do you think, what do you want for the future? You know, what do you want when you think about race and gender in the future? What do you want that to look like and how can we affect that kind of change? Dr. Mitchell, I'm going to start with you. Well, thank you. So I think it's so important that we look forward to the future and understanding that policies change. Uh, There's policy, there are politics, 
uh, and their life. And you can't change the inner um, um, feelings of people. But what we can do is look forward to the future and plan for it so that there will be some uh, incidents. They're going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we can't let that change who we are or what our plans are for our families and for other people and what we plan to do. So move forward. Uh, don't let any incident uh, totally uh, devastate you so that you cannot move forward in your own uh, plans yes. and that of your families. And also, I think it's so important to incorporate your family with what you do so that uh, I've heard uh, uh, Erica and Christina talk about their children and what they're doing. And you will do that. Uh, now, I have two daughters, two son-in-laws, three grandchildren, and sometimes um, my son-in-law's parents uh, all involved. So it's really incorporating those people around you. And like I said, I have 35, 40 people for Thanksgiving dinner now with uh, extended family. But that's so important to define who you are, keep your family close to you. And yes, they may um, change a little bit in the teenage years, but then they become 18 and come back again. Yeah. So uh, keep your family there with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Doc. And Dr. Bell, what's your, what's your hope for the future? Hmm. I, I just agree with everything Dr. Mitchell said. And I, you know, as especially as a mom of two young black boys, I hope for safety. I hope, um, you know, that just we can all heal, be more positive and optimistic moving forward as we try to work together. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I can echo my son. My uh, son is biracial. And when we were talking about this, situation he said to me we were in the kitchen and he said to me mom but if you get pulled over it's different it's just different and I wanted to say I mean I with all my the fabric of my being I wanted to say no Isaac it's not different and I said to him when you get pulled over or you're in a situation you need to be clear about your hands are in the air it is yes sir no sir and it is very different than if I get pulled over and I think going back and, you know, echoing what Dr. Mitchell said, it's like, keep your family close and, you know, keep kind of love at the forefront. Teach them that, you know, they, they, they can be a victim, going back to what Dr. Reza was talking about, they can be a victim, but they can always also be an advocate. And it's just as important to stand up when you see discrimination as it is to kind of stand up for yourself um, but in a way that, like you said, uh, Christina, you know, praying for safety for them. Uh, and Dr. Reza, we're going to close with you. What do you hope for the future? Oh, we've got you on mute. Here I go. <laughs> I'm just, I was a talking mouth over there. So, you know, I, I definitely um, will say, you know, um, you know, that when we hear these stories, they're absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and each of us, you know, again, can, you know, go to a point um, where we were profiled, you know, for um, our race, you know, our gender, you know, um, so we can definitely empathize uh, with that. And even if you haven't been in the situation, it's just still, um, you know, cause a moment of pause, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, that's just not right, you know? Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, for the families that have had to lose their loved ones, you know, that is gonna um, definitely be a journey. Um, and we definitely, you know, pray for them and their strength um, and their peace during this time. Um, and we just gotta be able to um, stand up when we see things that are just not right, 
you know, and I think uh, as a community, um, it should give pause to everybody, uh, whether you're a minority or not. Um, and then, you know, lastly, you know, even though we see these incidences, um, and it's sad and it's shocking that we're seeing these decades ago, but this is something that has been an issue for hundreds of years, right? Um, and I think, um, you know, again, it's something that's evolving, um, but we just got to be able to stand up. And, and then lastly, you know, just knowing that people are still mostly good, right? Yeah. So even though, you know, we see these incidences, there's so much positivity going on. And unfortunately, that is something that is not highlight, highlighted on the news often enough. Um, so I'm so glad that we're able to, you know, sit together in this forum uh, together, and hopefully we're able to impact the viewers uh, that, that see this um, Facebook live chat, um, because certainly, again, you know, we, we always want to remain positive and prayerful and um you know um i i think that you know again um there's so much good going on and we got to really center on that absolutely well i want to thank all three of you i mean i am inspired by all three of you and the way you manage your life your careers um i i feel so blessed to be in the position where i get to you know be around learn from um talk with grow with women like you. Uh, I do believe that, you know, women as a whole are finding a stronger voice. Um, we're finding each other. And I believe that, you know, the future holds so much for us, you know, not just in our own careers, but in the way we mother our children, in the way we kind of teach them, just like I was saying, how many people contributed to all those girls going to medical school. It's like we all have the power to impact our kids, the people around us, mentor uh, them, sponsor them, as Dr. Mitchell was talking about, open doors. And I see that happening more and more. Um, there is good news everywhere. Uh, we hope that we contribute to that good news by sharing in forums like this. If you would like to follow up with any of these three incredible um, female physician leaders, please uh, work with us. We're able to connect you um, with them for questions, for uh, comments on different things, because they all really have committed a part of their professional lives um, to, to becoming a voice for people that have been marginalized in the past. So I thank you for your time with us tonight. I look forward to the future and stay safe until the next time we see each other. Thank you again for being with us.